precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him for this purpose long before the world began. But now in these final days, he, is, he was sent to earth for all to see, and he did this for you.
if there's any more kids in the congregation that would like to come up for the children's story. Awesome. All righty. Good morning, boys and girls. All righty. We're going to start with a word of prayer. If everyone can bow their heads with me. Dear Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath morning. Thank you for letting us be here together to worship you. Lord, help us to be Christ-like, and thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for letting us get through this week, and Lord, we just ask for safety, and may the Holy Spirit just be with us today. In your precious name, I pray, amen. amen. All righty, boys and girls, today I'm going to read some scripture to you. Um, I will be speaking about the wise men. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it states, When they heard the king, they departed, and, be and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this story, um, while it has many things, today I'm going to focus on three things um, of how we can be like the wise men. My first um, way that we can be like the wise men is they never gave up. So kiddos, I want you guys to remember to never give up. The wise men never got tired of waiting for the bright star. They did everything in their power, um, and they were very diligent about discovering anything that would lead them to Jesus. And as Christians, we can never give up. We have to continue to serve and be examples for the Lord so that when he returns, we're prepared. Um, the second thing is they believed in Jesus for who he was. The wise men never saw Jesus um, heal the blind. He never, they never saw um, him walk on waters, but they continued to worship him. And our, and our lives um, won't truly change until, until we begin to worship God for who he is and, um, and not for what he can bless us with. A next, the next thing that we can do to be like the wise men is to be wholesomely focused. Um, the wise men had to be very focused. They had to focus on the star so that um, it could lead them to Jesus. But they had to be extremely focused because they had other things distracting them from doing that. So you, everyone has a star to focus on, especially because... Um, we have the enemy that is there to distract us from our big goal. So I want you guys to remember to never give up, to praise God and worship him for who he is, and to focus on the star, and that only star is God. Would anyone like to pray? Or do you want to pray? Yeah? Okay. All, all three of you can pray. To Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And when we get to celebrate you, when your birthday, and four more days until Christmas, we love you. Please keep us safe. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day, and please bless Christmas to go well, and please bless us, and please bless Yes, this day, amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and please bless who, have, who is suffering for help, who we don't know who is in the hospital or who has been sick. And please help everyone to bless and serve God. Amen. Amen. All right.
Alrighty, all you kiddos can grab baskets. Make sure you guys go around the entire church and make sure you don't miss anyone. It's time now for worship and giving. Um, our offering for this Sabbath is for local church budget. Uh, how many have been blessed by the by our church here? The, the facilities here, the, the programs we have, all the children's programs, uh, the ministry outreach that we do. Uh, there's a lot that this church does, and I've been blessed by it, and I know so many of you have too. Uh, we are a little short for the month. I know it's a busy month, and everyone's busy buying Christmas gifts and everything else, but... Uh, Let's please try to remember uh, the church budget uh, as, we, as we do our offering. Um, we also have a special offering uh, for, uh, for today, which is a, um, you, you may have seen in your um, bulletin, an extra envelope. Uh, this is for, um, a, uh, this is for um, special needs uh, that members uh, may have from time to time. Um, it's for uh, member assistance. Um, so I encourage you to consider uh, giving a gift for that too. Um, I've also been asked to remind everyone to please um, make more room in the pews if you can, scrunch together. We, we uh, have a lot more people coming in, uh, so please make room if you can. Um, also, we have an overflow in the fellowship hall, so if anybody would like to head over there too, uh, that, would, that would work well too. Uh, okay, shall we have our deacons come forward? We'll have a, have a little prayer right now, and then we'll start our offering. Lord, we thank you for this chance to give. Thank you for your spirit being here. Thank you for this beautiful facility and for all the programs that we uh, are able to put on. Um, we just ask for your blessing on this offering. May it go to just the right places and just the right causes. 
please help us to give deeply and to remember your church in this busy month. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Even before Jesus joined the human race, he saw the whole path that he would have to travel to save them. Even before he laid down his crown and covered his divinity with humanity, he saw every injury, every insult, every struggle, struggle he would face. His life on earth, with all its work and sacrifice, was brightened by the idea that by giving his life, he was bringing this world back to God. Even though he would bleed and suffer, carry the weight of all the sins of the world, and live under the shadow of unspeakable sadness, for the joy of bringing humans back to God, Jesus chose the cross. pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this day and opportunity that we have here to show how much you loved us and what you did to prove that. And like how we're nothing in comparison to all you can do and what you are, but you still cared about us and even sent your son to die for us. We thank you for that 
and to help us have a wonderful rest of this blessed day. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue into 2020, may this church continue to bless you in all that we do. We pray for the pastors and for each member and each visitor here that you impress their hearts, that you love them no matter what. And no matter what they do, you will always love them. We thank you. Please help us have a good day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm going to open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we are in awe of what you did for this human race that rebelled. We thank you for sending your Son to redeem us and to make room for us in your heavenly kingdom that you are soon to come and take us to be where you are. We thank you for this beautiful blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. So <clears throat> the question is, the time to be born? And <clears throat> this is something that I'm going to breeze through very quickly. I'm not going to follow PowerPoint presentation, two to three minutes per slide, because this is something we've been studying in our quarter, at least the first part of it. It's Daniel chapter 9, and this is 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, that's anointed, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And he, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of that week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. So we know that um, Messiah means anointed. And Jesus came and he was anointed in his baptism by the Holy Spirit. In Ezra chapter 6 verse 14 we see that there are three decrees, three commands that were given by three different kings. And that is, and they build it and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel, according to the commandment of Cyrus, who is a Persian king that overthrew Babylon, and Darius, the Persian, who is a king, not the one that's in Daniel chapter 5, but this was Darius who followed uh, Cyrus a few years, and then Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So the first year of Cyrus, he issued a decree for the Jews to return back to Jerusalem and to build the temple. In the second year of Darius, the Persian, there was a decree that he made to go and finish the temple because there had been some interruption in, the, in that process. And third, we have in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, there was a final decree about Jerusalem and that that would be important. So, again, decree to return and build the temple. That was in 536 BCE. The second year and the sixth year of Darius, which is 519 and 515, the temple was recon um, recommenced building it. And in 515, six years after that, it was dedicated and they held the Passover uh, in that year. And then the seventh year of Artaxerxes, which was 457, a date that Adventists are very familiar with, and something that the history books confirm was the seventh year of Artaxerxes when there was a final decree about Jerusalem, the finishing of the work, and uh, the anointing of the Messiah. So, 
457 is our beginning point. There's 69 weeks, 7 weeks and 62 weeks for 483 years. And when we look at that, the first seven weeks was the walls and the streets rebuilt. And then the, the 69 weeks, there was Messiah, the anointing, his baptism in 27 AD, if we do the math. The 70th week had to do with the Messiah being cut off, but not for himself, for each one here and for each one in this world. And then the close of that 70th week was the dispensation to the Gentiles. The Jewish religion had rejected the Messiah as a body, and God's ministry through Paul went to the Gentiles. So let's look at the evidence for Jesus' birth. So Luke chapter 3.23 says that Jesus was about 30 years old, when he was baptized. <clears throat> Tiberius Caesar had reigned 15 years, Luke 3.1. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Luke 3.1. The temple was under construction for 46 years. And we have Herod was king when Jesus was born, Matthew 2.1. So as we look at our timeline, Tiberius Caesar began his co-regency with his adoptive father, Caesar Augustus, <clears throat> from Luke chapter 3-1 in the year 12 AD. 12 AD plus 15 years, 27 AD. We have a historical confirmation of that fact and the timing. Pontius Pilate became governor of Judea in 26. So when Jesus began his ministry, it was just a year later, that uh, Jesus was there. So again, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea is in harmony with what we know from the biblical evidence and historical. Herod began to enhance the temple in 19 BC. And in John chapter 2, verse 20, the Passover had just begun. It was in the month of the Passover. <clears throat> Jesus was at the temple and they were essentially saying, well, Jesus said he's going to destroy this temple and he would build it again in three days. And the Jews came back and said, he's, this temple's been built for 46 years and you're going to build it in three days? So <clears throat> when we look at that 19 BC plus 28 minus the one for no year zero, we again have 27 AD, which is when Christ was baptized. <clears throat> Finally, we have Herod who died in 4 BC. So we know that Jesus was born in 4 BC or before. And again, if you take 4 BC and you add 27 to that, you would get, subtracting the one year that is year zero, you have, he was about 30 when Herod um, was alive. So, The other thing to look at from a New Testament perspective is we see that Simeon, who was in the temple when Jesus was dedicated after the 33 days of purification, he was looking for the Messiah. And so Simeon recognized it and blessed the baby Jesus when he came into the temple grounds. We have Anna, who was in the temple as well on that same occasion, and she recognized the Messiah and gave a blessing so you had people who were looking for the coming of the Messiah at the appropriate time. You had the wise men who were searching, and they saw the star, and they recognized the significance of it, and they came. So, the conclusion. The Bible is historically accurate and true. The Bible is consistent within itself. Old Testament and New Testament tell the same story. Secular history, which is something that is always a marvel to me when I go to my encyclopedia and I see that the dates for these things and everything lines up, is something that confirms the Bible and the timing of his birth, his baptism, and his death. Our hope is not in vain, but living. 
we have nothing to fear unless we forget what has happened in the past because God tells us beforehand what will be so that when it comes to pass, we'll believe. And we have all this Bible evidence that says God is faithful and true. He knows the beginning from the end. And praise be to God for sending his son into the earth to become linked with humanity forever to save us from sin. And we know he wasn't born most likely on December 25th, but <clears throat> the Bible is interesting. This is something that I've um, really appreciated is it's consistent even in the perspective that we don't know the day or necessarily the month or even necessarily the year that he was born. But we know that when he was baptized, we have very specific evidence to that effect. And we can praise God for um, what he truly came to do, which is to die, lay down his life for his friends. And he counts us all his friends. So his focus is not on his birth, but his baptism, ministry, laying down his life for his friends. So why observe his birth? It's a great time to share. The doors are open unlike any other time of the year. I've, I've went to homes and tried to hand out literature. People say, no, not interested. But you go on Christmas and people will receive Buddhist Everybody is happy because it's just a time where God has opened up the doors to share the gospel with those that need to hear it before the end. Thank you.
the king of the universe, gave up all of his power and honor to become a human. He left the glory of heaven to live in wood and stone houses and walk on dirt roads. His supernatural splendor was buried deep so that no one would follow him because of it. He wanted nothing to do with looking good or being popular. He wanted only the appeal of truth, real heavenly truth, to grab people's interest and attention. He wanted people to accept him because they recognized him from the words of scripture. There is one word that describes the night that he came, ordinary. The sky was ordinary. An occasional gust stirred the leaves and chilled the air. The stars were diamonds sparkling on black velvet. Fleets of clouds floated front in front of the moon. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful night. A night worth peeking out your bedroom window to admire but not really an unusual one. No reason to expect a surprise, nothing to keep a person awake, an ordinary night with an ordinary sky. The sheep were ordinary, some fat, some scrawny, some with barrel bellies, some with twig legs, common animals, no fleece made of gold, no history makers, no blue ribbon winners. They were simply sheep lumpy sleeping silhouettes on a hillside and the shepherds peasants they were probably wearing all the clothes they owned smelling like sheep and looking just as woolly they were conscientious willing to spend the night with their flocks but you won't find their staves in a museum nor their writings in the library no one asked their opinion on social justice or the application of the torah they were nameless simple. An ordinary night with ordinary sheep and ordinary shepherds. And were it not for a God who loves to hook an extra on the front of an ordinary, the night would have gone unnoticed. The sheep would have been forgotten and the shepherds would have slept the night away. But God dances amidst the common. All of a sudden, the black sky exploded with brightness. Trees that had been shadows jumped into clarity. Sheep that had been silent became a chorus of curiosity. One minute the shepherd was dead asleep, the next he was rubbing his eyes and staring into the face of an angel. The night was ordinary no more.
the angel said, Joseph, descendant of God, a David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. While shepherds watched their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around. Fear not, he said, for, the mi for mighty dread had seized their troubled mind. Glad tiding of great joy I bring to you and all mankind. Blessed are the meek. Jesus explained, blessed are the willing. That's why the announcement went first to the shepherds. They didn't ask God if he was sure he knew what he was doing. While the theologians were sleeping, and the elite were dreaming, and the successful were snoring, the meek were kneeling. They were kneeling before the one only the meek will seek. They were kneeling in front of Jesus.
Suppose you could give a gift to Christ. What would it be? How could you possibly select a gift for the one who not only has everything, but who made everything? The wise man did. They can be an example to us. In addition to the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they gave the Savior some gifts we can give him today. Their hope, their time, and their worship. The wandering wise men gave Jesus their hope. When everyone else saw a night sky, this small band of men saw the light. The sight of the stars sparked a desire in their hearts that sent them packing. They went, seeking Jesus. When night comes to your world, what do you see? The darkness or the stars? Hopelessness or hopefulness? Sometimes, just as he did so long ago, God uses the darkness to reveal his stars. The light shines in the darkness. If your heart has been shadowed by the darkness of loneliness or grief or disappointment, look for the light that only he can give. I am the light of the world. The person who follows me will never live in darkness, but will have the light that gives light. Give God your hope for Christmas. While you're giving, give God your time the most valuable thing you have to spend. The wise men did. Before they gave God their presence, E-N-T-S, they gave him their presence, E-N-C-E. -E. Before that one incredible moment, when they knelt before Jesus, the wise men spent many moments, months, perhaps years, searching in anticipation of that meeting. Just as a wise man devoted themselves to seeking a savior, so can you. You will seek him and find him when you seek him with all your heart. Deuteronomy 4.29. We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar Field and fountain And when they did find him, the wise men gave Jesus another gift, their worship. It's probable that these men were men of health. How else could they embark on an extended journey and still have gifts to give at its end? It's likely these men had influence. How else could they have commanded an audience with Herod? They must have had an intellect. How else could they have navigated across thousands of miles of terrain following a star? Men of wealth, wealth 
influence, and intellect. What did they do when they saw Jesus? They fell down and worshipped him. In worship, we simply stand before God with a prepared and willing heart and let God do his work. And he does. He wipes away the tears. He mops away the perspiration. He softens our furrowed brows. He touches our cheeks. And he changes our faces as we worship. The wise man sought the child of God just as God seeks his children. The Father, too, is actively seeking such people to worship him, John 4, 23. The hope, the gifts of hope, time, and worship, these three gifts the wise, the wise people still give. Here is what we want to know. We want to know how long God's love will endure. Does he really love us forever? Not just on Saturday when our shoes are shined and our hair is fixed. We want to know, how does God feel about me when I'm a jerk? Not when I'm peppy and positive and ready to tackle world hunger. Not then. I know how he feels about me then. Even I like me, then. I want to know how he feels about me when I snap at anything that moves, when my thoughts are gutter level, when my tongue is sharp enough to slice a rock. How does he feel about me then? Can anything separate us from the love Christ has for us? God answered our question before we asked it. So he'd see his answer, he lit a sky, or the sky with a star. So we'd hear it, he filled the night with a choir. And so we'd believe it, he did what no man ever dreamed. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He placed his hand on the shoulder of humanity and said, you're something special. The star maker turns to us one by one and says, you are my child, I love you dearly. I'm aware that someday you'll turn from me and walk away, but I want you to know I've already provided a way back. Will you turn to me? And to prove it, he did something extraordinary. Stepping from the throne, he removed his robe of light and wrapped himself in skin, pigmented human skin. The light of the universe entered a dark, wet womb. He whom angels worshipped nestled himself in the placenta of a peasant, was bathed into a cold night, and then slept on cow's hay. Can anything make me stop loving you? God asks. Watch me speak your language, sleep on your earth, and feel your hurts. Behold 
Me, behold the maker of sight and sound as he sneezes, coughs, and blows his nose. You wonder if I understand how you feel? Look into the dancing eyes of the kid in Nazareth. That's God, that's God walking to school. Ponder the toddler at Mary's table. That's God spilling his milk. You wonder how long my love will last? Find your answer on a splintered cross, on a craggy hill. That's me you see up there, your maker, your God, nail stabbed and bleeding, covered in spit and sin soaked. That's your sin that I'm feeling. That's your death that I'm dying. That's your resurrection that I'm living. That's how much I love you. How great is God's love? How can the creator of the universe care about the twists and turns of your life's journey? Ponder this thought. If God is able to place the stars in their sockets and suspend the sky like a curtain, do you think it remotely possible that God is able to guide your life? If your God is mighty enough to ignite the sun, could it be that he is mighty enough to light your path? If he cares enough about the planet Saturn, to give it rings, or Venus to make it sparkle? Is there an outside chance that he cares enough about you to meet your needs? Or, as Jesus says, Look at the birds in the air. They don't plant or harvest or store into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them, and you no, you are worth much more than the birds. Why do you worry about clothes? 
Look how the lilies in the fields grow. They don't work or make clothes for themselves, but I tell you that even Solomon with his riches was not dressed as beautifully as one of these flowers. God clothed the grass and the field, which is alive to today, but tomorrow is thrown into the fire. So you can even be sure that God clothe you. Don't have so little faith. Why did he do it? Did he have to give the birds a song and the mountains a peak? Was he required to put stripes on the zebra and the hump on the camel? Would we have known the difference had he made the sunsets gray instead of orange? Why do stars have twinkles and waves snowy crests? Why dash the cardinal in red and drape the beluga whale in white? Why wrap creation in such splendor? Why go to such trouble to give such gifts? Will the congregation please stand for our next hymn? Congregation, please sit. So why do you give gifts? You do the same. I've seen you searching for a gift. I've seen you stalking the malls and walking the aisles. I'm not talking about the obligatory gifts. I'm not describing the last minute purchase of drugstore perfume on the way to the birthday party. Forget blue light specials and discount purchases. I'm talking about that extra special person and that extra special gift. I'm talking about stashing away a few dollars a month out of the grocery store money to buy him some lizard skin boots, staying up all Christmas Eve, assembling the new bicycle. Why do you do it? You do it so the eyes will pop. You do it so the heart will stop. You do it so the jaw will drop. You do it to hear those words of disbelief. You did this for me? That's why you do it. And that's why God did it. Next time a sunrise steals your breath, or a meadow of flowers leaves you speechless, remain that way. Say nothing and listen as heaven whispers. Do you like it? I did it just for you. If you were the only person on earth, the earth would look exactly the same. The Himalayas would still have their drama. The Caribbean would still have its charm and the sun would still nestle behind the Rockies in the evenings and spray light on the desert in the mornings. If you were the sole pilgrim on this globe, God would not diminish its beauty one degree because he did it all for you. And he's waiting for you to discover his gift. He's waiting for you to stumble into the den, rub the sleep from your eyes and see the bright, the bright red bike he assembled just for you. 
He's waiting for your eyes to pop and your heart to stop. He's waiting for the moment between the dropping of the jaw and the leap of the heart. For in the silence, he leans forward and whispers, I did it just for you. Find such love hard to believe? That's okay. Just because we can't imagine God giving us sunsets, don't think God doesn't do it. God's thoughts are higher than ours. God's ways are greater than ours. And sometimes out of his great wisdom, our Father in heaven gives us a piece of heaven just to show how much he cares. The noise and the bustle started earlier than usual in the village. As night gave way to, day, to dawn, people were already on the streets. Vendors were positioning themselves on the corners of the most heavily traveled avenues. Store owners were unlocking the doors to their shop. Children were awakened by the excited barking of the street dogs and the complaints of donkeys pulling carts. The owner of the inn had awakened earlier than most in town. After all, the inn was full, all the beds taken. Every available mat or blanket had been put to use. Soon, all the customers would be stirring and there would be a lot of work to do. Everyone was too busy. The day was upon them. The day's bread had to be made. The morning chores had to be done. There was too much to do to imagine that the impossible had occurred. God had entered the world as a baby.
I have loved you with an everlasting love. Was he playing games when he said, nothing, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ? Buried in the seldom queried minds of the minor prophets is this jewel. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you. You will rest in his love and he will sing and be joyful about you. He will sing and be joyful about you? Note who is active and who is passive. Who is singing and who is resting? Who is rejoicing over his loved one? And who is being rejoiced over? We tend to think we are the singers and God is a singee. Most certainly that is often the case, but apparently there are times when God wishes we would just be still and let him sing over us. I can see you squirming. You say that you aren't worthy of such affection. Neither was Judas, but Jesus washed his feet. Neither was Peter, but Jesus fixed him breakfast. Neither were the disciples, but Jesus took time to sit at their table. Besides, who are we to determine if we are worthy? Our job is simply to be still long enough to let him have us and let him love us. Somehow, not only for Christmas, but all the long year through, the joy that you give to others is the joy that comes back to you. And the more you spend in blessing the poor and lonely and sad, the more your heart's possessing returns to make you glad. things we do to give gifts to those we love but we don't mind do we we would do it all again in fact we do it all again every Christmas every birthday every so often when we find ourselves in foreign territory grown-ups are in toy stores dads are in teen stores wives are in the hunting department and husbands are in the purse department not only do we enter unusual places we do unusual things we assemble bicycles at midnight. We hide the new tires with mag wheels under the stairs. One fellow surprised his wife on their anniversary by showing a video of their wedding pictures. And we do it all again. Having pressed the grapes of service, we drink life's sweetest wine, the wine of giving. We are at our best when we are giving. In fact, we are most like God when we are giving. Have you ever wondered why God gives so much? We could exist on far less. He could have left the world flat and gray. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known the difference, but he didn't. He splashed orange in the sunrise and cast the sky blue. 
And if you love to see geese as they gather, chances are you'll see that too. Did he have to make a squirrel's tail furry? Was he obliged to make birds sing? And the funny way the chickens scurry, or the majesty of thunder when it rings? Why give a flower fragrance? Why give food its taste? Could it be he loves to see that look upon your face? God's gifts shed light on God's heart, God's good and generous heart. Jesus' brother James tells us, every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are, are rivers of light, cascading down from the Father of light. Every gift reveals God's love, but no gift reveals his love more than the gifts of the cross. The only act, the only act required for our salvation was the shedding of blood. Yet he did so much more, so much more. Search the scene of the cross, and what do you find? A wine-soaked sponge, a sign, two crosses beside Christ. Divine gifts intended to stir that moment, that split second when your face will brighten, your eyes will widen, and God will hear you whisper, you did this for me? Could it be that hill of the cross is rich with God's gifts? As you ponder what the manger means to you, unwrap God's gift of grace, the cross. As you feel the timber of the cross and trace the braid of the crown and finger the point of the spike, pause and listen. Perchance you will hear him whisper, I did it just for you. Don't be satisfied with angels. Don't be satisfied with the stars in the sky. Seek him out as the shepherds did. Long for him as Simeon did. Worship him as a wise man did. Risk whatever it takes to see Christ. Jesus was treated as we deserve to be, so that we can be treated the way he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, which he had nothing to do with. This was so that we can be saved by his righteous goodness, which we have nothing to do with. He suffered our death so that we can be given life. 
We are healed because of his wounds. With his life and his death, Jesus did more than just restore the damage caused by sin. Satan tried to separate humankind from God forever. But because of Jesus, we are more closely tied to God than if we had never sinned in the first place. By becoming one of us, Jesus bound himself to humanity with a tie that will never be broken. The voice that cried from the cross, it is finished, will penetrate the graves and tombs, and those who died believing in Jesus will rise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were opened, but at his second coming, all his children who have died will hear his voice and come out to the glorious life that never ends. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead will glorify and raise his church, his followers, above every name and power in this world and in the world to come. Will, the, will everyone please stand for our next hymn? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved.
One more time, a cappella. Father, our hearts have been touched. Amen. Lord, we are so grateful for you. We're so grateful for Jesus, who left everything behind for me. Wow. Father, we ask you to please forgive our sins. Help us to be like you, to touch hearts of those whose hearts are broken, those who have no bread or clothes or whatever that is during this Christmas season. God, you're wonderful. And our present sufferings are not worthy for the glory that will be revealed in us. We'll love you, Jesus, so very much. Please don't let us go. Let the whole congregation say, Amen. Amen. As we leave this place, everybody's invited to come and join the meal with us. All glory to God. Everything happened here today. Amen. Thank you.